The first one is they would write programs, they would do one thing and do it well. Second one, they would write programs to work together. And how do they work together? That's the third principle, which is like you write programs to handle text streams. So your program would communicate to each other using text streams. And this is basically like the foundation of all the Unix tools that we're going to be using today. So first of all, I'm going to introduce you to shell and scripting. So what is a shell? Well, shell is, as you can see, it's an efficient and textual interface to your computer. It actually provides like an interactive programming language. You also call this like scripting. So like, you see like how do you make a scripts? There are actually many shells you can choose for. So like by default, I'm just using the default one, which is bash, born again shell. So uh, there are also like any uh, like many different kinds of shells. Like for example, like someone make a shell based on the C language, then they call it C shell, CSH. Someone also make, people also make like uh, so-called better shells like. Fish or ZSH or KSH. Like for example, if you're using Mac OS, many of them are actually using Fish. But uh, I'm going to be teaching you more of like the most common ubiquitous kind of shell, which is Bash. Like every single Unix machine that you have, most likely have Bash in it. Like almost definitely. So that's why this is why like, I would focus on it on this workshop. So first of all, we have this thing called the shell prompt. So as you can see on the right hand side, right, I open my terminal which would run my shell, and I'm greeted with the shell, so uh, with this prompt. So like for this one, for my own personal use, I've actually customized it so it looks a bit different. Like you can see like it's actually two lines and all, and okay, let me zoom in a bit more. Yeah, so it's actually two lines, right? And if, you, if I actually go to my Linux instance, you would see that actually like it's very bare bone. It's just one line of prompt. And you can actually change this, like you can actually read up online how to change this, but uh, the most basic one is that this thing is controlled by something called PS1. So if I want to, I can always just set it to whatever I want. So say I want it to be like this sign. The, this sign. So like if you run node, you would know how this works. So it would just change it to here. And like if I want to reset it, I would just look, reload my... It is going to take a long time. But yeah, so... Uh, that's that's the prompt. Basically, uh, the prompt is used to like uh, when you want to type things inside. That's what you use the prompt for. And there are actually many like different commands. So the most important one I feel is man. Man is short for manual. Okay, so basically for all these things, you would see that they're actually like abbreviations because programmers don't like to type long things. They would just like type something short and be able to see whatever they're doing. So. Uh, there are many different commands that are important besides man. So man is used to actually check the manual pages of different commands. So using man, you can actually learn about all the different commands that there is. So for example, there's cd. So uh, for example, in this data, you know that there's actually a folder called tmp, right? So if I want to change the directory that I'm working on right now into that directory, I would call cd for change directory. So I would just do cd tmp. And now like you can see that I'm actually inside tmp right now. And uh, for CD, there's actually like in, in Unix environment, there's always two special directories, dot and dot dot. And they are actually used whenever you want to move up. Like dot dot is used when you want to move up, and dot is used whenever you want to refer to the current directory. So if I type change directory to dot, that's the current directory, right? Like dot means the current directory. So if I press enter, nothing would happen because I'm changing directory to the current directory. But if I say I want to move up, so right now I'm in data TMP, but I want to move to just data, then I can do CD with double dots. Then I will move up to just data. I want to move up some more, I can just do another CD dot dot again. I want to move into data, I just CD data. And in case you're not familiar with, with, with CD, you can do man CD. It's actually a built-in. So like uh, built-in is basically uh, commands that are built into the shell itself. So usually for built-ins, like whenever you do man something and you go into the build, you get into the built-in screen, it's more helpful to run help than the command. So help cd, then it would actually tell you, uh, like what it does: change the shell working directory, change the current directory to directory to dir, the variable blah blah blah. So like you can just read up more about like what options you can use. Like they would give all the options. There's also ls. ls is short for list. So you would list the current files in directory. 
So you can see, like, in this directory, I have lock and tmp. And they're actually colored a bit differently. So lock is a file, and tmp is a directory. Like, this is one of the options that I use, which is, like, to color the output. There's mkdir to make directory. So if you do mkdir, like, hello, and then I list, now you see, like, there's hello as the directory as well. Can you all see? Yeah, so there's, there's a new directory called hello. And then there's rm to remove files in directory. So uh, I'm just going to make a file. OK. So I have a file called a, right? And I want to remove a. I can just do rm a, and it will remove it. If I list the files now, you don't have a anymore. <laughs> like, all of this right now looks like very simple. You can also do it with a file explorer or using Finder or like whatever file explorer, right? But later on, you'll find out that why is this so powerful? Because you can actually do more stuff. Like you can uh, delete different kinds of files based on whatever you type. It's also CP to copy file. So for example, I have this log file, right? I want to copy the log file into something else called like say uh, log dot backup, for example. And I press enter. So if I list the files again, now I have like two files. One is called log and one is called log backup. If I want to move it, for example, I want to move log backup into the hello directory, right? I can just do mv for move. Move the log backup to hello. So now you see that like uh, log backup is gone. And if I change the directory into inside hello, and I type list, now you see log backup is inside. But then if you move up, right, you want to delete this hello directory and just try to RM it. You would get this error message, like RM is a directory, like hello is a directory, so you can't remove it. So uh, basically this kind of like a safety feature of some sort, basically if you delete directory, everything inside will be deleted. Usually that's not what you want. You, you might be mistyping something. So in order to delete the directory, you have to actually add something, el something else called dash R for recurse. So just do rm dash r hello. And then when you press enter, it will actually delete the directory. So when you just do rm, you can be sure that it will only delete files. It wouldn't delete directories unless you specify, specify uh, dash r. That's for deleting directories. And another thing that's quite interesting. So let's make uh, directory hello again. So now we have hello. So we have this mv for move, right? But do you realize that actually when you rename a file, it's kind of like you're moving the file from one name to another name. So you can rename files by using the mv command. So if I do mv hello to world, for example, and then I list the files, then you can see that now like hello has changed name to world. Because that's kind of moving as well. Any questions so far? How is minus r different from minus r? Oh. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you know later on, but basically F means false. So like with dash R, they, they might ask you questions about like, are you sure you want to delete this and s others, but if you dash F, then it would just like forcefully delete everything. I tried copying my log folder to the desktop and it says permission denied, but do I need to use sudo for copying? You shouldn't need to, like you don't have right access to the, what's your desktop? Desktop is a normal desktop. It shouldn't, it shouldn't give you the error. Can you copy to dash tmp? Like you copy log to dash tmp, uh, sorry, slash tmp. That's for temporary. Okay, yeah. I think somehow you don't have right access to your desktop. That's really weird, but yeah. Just use another directory to copy it to. Any other question? Everyone clear? Like, don't be shy to ask, just ask away, because I know this, uh, like, this topic is quite advanced. Like, it's, quite, it's not easy to grasp at first. OK, great. So uh, moving on, like, actually, Bash has shortcuts based on Emacs key binding. So Emacs is this uh, editor. But if you don't know Emacs, it's fine, because I'm just like, mentioning all the different shortcuts here. It's quite useful, because like, uh, say you type some really long command, right? Like, you have you're typing all the way until here, and then like, oh no, I need to go delete the KAJ into like AAJ. Like, usually people would just like go back all the way like that. But it's actually very, it's very, it takes very long. 
So what you can do is you can actually press Control A, and it will straight away jump to the beginning of the line. And from here, if you want to move forward one word, you can actually, okay, if you're using Linux, you can actually press Control left and right to do it. Like you don't have to use the Alt B and Alt F. And if you're on Mac, I think you can just do Alt left and Alt right, and that should move you like front or back. One word. And then, uh, okay, so say I want to actually delete this whole word like K-A-J-S-H-D-K-J-H. I want to delete the whole thing. So what I can do is I can actually uh, move one word here. And I use Control W. Control W means delete this word, like delete the word before the cursor. Okay, so say instead I want to do this one, it said S J D H G. So I just move there, and I press Control W, and it will just delete that whole thing. Right? The thing will just be gone. There's also like a lot of other useful things, like for example, you can uh, delete from the cursor to the start of line, which is Control U. So from here, if I press Control U, it will actually remove everything from that cursor to the beginning of the line. And then say I have, some, uh, I have something in the beginning of the line now. I want to instead now delete from there to the end of the line. I can use Control K instead. And we delete it. So like this are like all the different shortcuts that you can use to like make your life better in Shell. Because you can't just anyhow click and edit the different things. So this is how you actually do it. Like basically, the way Shell is built is that your hand should never leave the keyboard. Because actually, moving to use the mouse takes time. And you want to minimize that as much as possible. And then uh, there are also command control shortcuts. So uh, this might not be like something that you would understand immediately, but like, as we go on, you would basically learn more. But one very useful one is actually called co is Control L, which clears the screen. So if you if you see just now, I've been clearing my screen a lot of time. So like you see suddenly the screen just goes like that. The way to do it is using Control L. It clears the screen and it will just show you the prompt. And for the, for the rest, I think I'll show you later on. Like basically, uh, there's Control C, Control Z. Like those things are basically like uh, things to control whatever is happening with whenever you type a command and you run it and you want to do something to the running command. Those are the things that you'd use. Any questions so far? Yes. Which one? Control. Uh, when you have like a really, really long output. So for example, just, just for example, I, I, I'm running some, some command that would output very, something very long, like uh, just for the sake of it, I output this. It's very long, right? And you don't want to keep on seeing this like trippy thing, so you can press Control S, it would stop the output. You can press Control Q and it will continue the output. Control C to stop. Yeah. So so like sometimes you you have like this like you run something suddenly you just like output like a shit ton of things, right? You can actually remove it. What was the command to print it? Oh, I, I just print like random stuff, so like cut def random you random. Oh, you mean it's specifically your thing or it's uh, no no, it's it's in every Unix computer. You can use it to generate random bytes. Oh, nice. Yeah. There's also zero. It will just keep on giving you null characters, that's why it doesn't print anything. And if you want to keep on typing yes, you can just do yes. You just give on Y continuously. Uh, control C. As like as here, Control C terminates the command. Yes. Uh huh. It jumps. Yeah, it jumps. Because otherwise, your, your shell has to buffer an unlimited amount of text, and it can't get rid of, yeah. OK, any other question? OK, great. So now, uh, basically, uh, like I'm going to go through into scripting. So like scripting is basically, OK, so right now, you can already type commands uh, straight away on the shell, right? Like ls, cd, and whatever, those are commands. But sometimes you want to do this in a file that you can just run so that it will actually like do several steps at once. So you can open an editor. Like if you are new to all these shell things, I recommend nano for now because it's quite self-explanatory. Like if you run nano, 
you can see like you want to exit, you press Control X. They will actually tell you all the different things, like what to press to get to a certain uh, menu. So if you're here, like you open your Nano, right? You can type the script. So just follow exactly. Bin sh echo something. And then once you're done, if you're using Nano, right, you can Control X, and then uh, save modified buffer. Answer yes, like they say, press Y, right? File name to write. Let's say the name is example script. So example dash script. And then once you save it, you press enter, it would quit and it would have saved the file. Yeah, so now if you ls, right, you can see the example script is a new file there. And okay, everyone follows? But right now, you can't run the script yet. Because in Unix, like, for example, the problem you encountered just now, permission denied. Basically, in Unix, different files have different permissions. You can either read, you can either write, or you can execute. Right now, this example script that you just created, you can read, you can write, but you can execute yet, unless you specify that you want to execute this. And the way to do it is actually ch mod, so you change the mode of the file to be executable. That's why you plus x. Means you want to make this file executable. If you want to make it not executable, you do minus x. And then give the file name. And quick tips, you can actually type ex, right, and press tab, and the shell will complete it for you. So I like do ch mod plus x, plus x, right? Then you type e even, like you can tap, then it will show you. Like, it would complete it for you. Then you press enter. It, it shouldn't show you anything, but now that thing is executable. Like if you ls and it shows, and your shell shows colors, it should change the color to show that it's actually executable. And the way to run your script is to actually do a dot slash. Okay, what does dot mean again? current directory. So you say that in this current directory, I have this command called example script. I have this script called example script, and I want to run it. And if you press enter, you should see the word something comes up. Say again? Oh, uh, I, you can ask me later. The, I have my dot files. As in, uh, it's, there, there's this configuration file that you can change to make it more colorful. Uh, if your ls doesn't show colors, you can do ls dash big G, then it should show colors. Okay, yeah. Because uh, I think in, in, in Linux, by default, their ls will only show color, but not for Mac. So if your Mac doesn't show color, you can use ls dash big G. It must be big, like for Unix, it's actually case sensitive. So like whether you do like big G or small G actually matters. So everyone can get this uh, something comes out. So basically what's happening here, right, is that uh, when you do echo something, right, whatever comes after something is actually will be printed to the screen. So if, for example, you do uh, echo hello world, then it will be printed also. But you need to be careful because like, some characters actually mean something different to the shell, so like, be careful not to use those characters. So for example, a bang would mean something else, like echo, hello, bang. Oh, actually, it, it works fine, okay. But in other commands, it might not work fine. So like, be careful with all the punctuations, like different punctuations. It might mean different things to the shell. And then you also notice that this, there's this first line. You have like the hash, bang, then slash bin, slash sh. So that thing is actually called the shebang. Uh, no one knows why it's called shebang. Like some people say it's because like hash bang, and then people just started like slurring it. It becomes shebang. But basically, uh, what that thing is is actually to specify the interpreter. So when your shell runs this thing, it knows how to run it. In this case, we use sh for shell. So if you're running a Python script, right, you can also do this. So for example. Uh, Let's just use like test.py. I can actually do something similar, but instead I would use like user slash bin slash environment python. Say I just uh, print hello. Something like this, right? As in like, uh, if you don't know Python, you should know that this thing would just print hello. 
and then I same thing, I chmod uh, plus x test.py, and now I can just run it directly straight away. So like that thing would just specify uh, what you're supposed to do with it. If I change this instead to bin sh, right, it shouldn't work. So if I run test.py, then it will just say syntax error. Why? Because they're actually running it on the shell directly. So if I do this on my shell, you see, you actually got the exact same error. Syntax error, near unexpected token, blah, blah. Any question so far? And basically using this, uh, this scripts, right, you can just put uh, like uh, an arbitrary command inside and your shell will just execute those things inside. And then the next one, like you've been seeing all these dash uh, business, right? Like this command, then you have dash g, dash s, dash r, dash f. Like these things are called flags. So flex is actually like parameters. So you want to get some, like you want to run some programs with some options. Like you don't want to just get the default behavior. You want to change some behavior. For example, like RM doesn't delete directories. You want to make it delete directories. What you use is actually this thing called flex. And flex is always like prefixed with a dash. And there's two different kinds of flex. There's a short form and there's the long form. The short form only has one dash and the long form has double dash. And usually, like a, sh a long form would have an equivalent short form. A short form can also be a combination of different long forms. Basically, uh, it's used so much that people actually like make it shorter. Like for example, you want to get help. Instead of typing like dash h, sorry dash dash help, you can just do dash h, so it saves time. For example, like rm, I want to get help. I can just dash h, and it would say or like a very quick overview, unlink file. Like if you want to get more detailed information, you can always do like man rm. Then it would tell you like uh, more specifically uh, what it would do. And later on, you would see also that like, okay, like I'm using Mac and you see the header, it says BSD general commands manual. So a Mac is equivalent to a BSD. Like all the commands are actually BSD. So it might run a bit differently from Linux. Say, uh, in Linux, I do the same thing, man rm. You see that the top thing is just user commands. This is actually like a Linux man page. And you will see that they're actually like slightly different. You see rm, remove files or directories. Another one is like rm, unlink, remove directory entries. Yes? rm uh, dash uh, h is giving us the user log. So oh yeah, uh, rm is a pretty old thing, so I think it doesn't take dash h. Even ls, uh, ls it just uses ls, it doesn't give us the... Yeah, it doesn't. Like it's it's uh, something that's very general. Like generally, most programs take dash h to mean something. Like if I do Ruby dash h, it will actually tell me like all this uh, help thing, right? Mm -hmm. If I do Python dash h, it would also do the same thing. But some of the older programs don't actually like they actually use dash h to mean something else. But in general, whenever you're in doubt, if a new program you don't know how to use it, just run it with dash h at the end. It will usually tell you how to use the program. And if you use short flex, like multiple short flex, you can actually combine them. So like this flex are already short, but you can even make them shorter by uh, actually just like smashing them together. So instead of doing rm dash r dash f, you can do rm dash rf, the two are equivalent. So you're wondering what does dash r, what does dash f mean? You can go to uh, rm and you can go down here, you see like dash f, Attempt to remove the files you're prompting for confirmation. So dash f means false, means that it wouldn't ask you for confirmation whether to delete these files. And dash r, remember, big r and small r is usually different. But in this case, they say that big r and small r are the same. Because the dash small r is equivalent to the dash big r. And they are basically like attempt to remove the file hierarchy rooted in each file argument. So basically, all it's saying is like, if you have a directory, there's a hierarchy, right? You have like something that's lower. So if you use dash r, it will actually attempt to remove all these files. That's why you need dash r to remove a directory. So the short flex, when you combine them, you can actually use different permutations. So like rm dash rf and rm dash fr is the same. It doesn't matter. A double dash is actually used to uh, signify the end of command options. So basically, uh, sometimes you want to, for example, you want to uh, create a file. To create a file, you actually use this command called touch. So 
there are many there are many users, but one of the use of touch is to actually uh, create a file. So change file access, blah blah blah. But then you see by default, okay, if if any file does not exist, it is created with the default permissions here. So that's why like that's that's why we can oh my god. That's why we can use uh, touch to create a file. But say you want to create a file, say like touch dash v or dash f for example. But you see the dash f actually uh is actually already a flag that is touch takes in. So how do you do it? You use this double dash thing, which tells the program, whatever comes after this is not a flag anymore. That's all it's doing. So if I do touch, okay, if I do touch dash f directly, you see that it will just fail because like dash f is supposed to mean something else. But if I do touch dash 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 f, and then now I list the files. Now you have this file called dash f, and it's the same thing if you want to remove a file. You can just rm dash f. It would just like it wouldn't do anything. You have to actually uh, rm dash 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 f. So whatever comes after dash dash is not a flag anymore. Any of you? Are you all okay? There's also this thing called uh, grub g r e p. Like uh, I won't really go through it right now. I'll go through it later. But basically, it's the same thing. Like if you want to use, uh, if you want to use the flags, uh, like you want to use something that looks like a flag, but you want to actually pass it directly to the program, they use dash dash. And as I mentioned previously, actually, like some of the flags are actually quite standard. So you have like dash a refers to all files. So, for example, if I just ls, uh, okay, this is not a good one. Say here I ls, right? It would show uh, these files. But there are actually uh, another file here that actually begins with a, with a period. And by default in Unix, by convention, the dot means it's a hidden file. You shouldn't be able to look it up. So if I touch dot uh, find me, for example. So it should create a file called dot find me, right? But if I ls, can you find that file? No, right? So dash a means usually to show everything, including the hidden files. So if I do ls dash a, then you can see all the things beginning with a dot. Including dot for the current directory, right? <coughs> dot dot for the directory above. You can see dot git and of course the one that we made just now, which is dot find me. And then uh, dash f usually means forcing something. Uh, you rm dos, rm dash f. It wouldn't even ask you for confirmation. It would just silently like, delete the files. Dash H for most commands will display the will display the help. Dash V enables uh, verbose output. So, for example, uh, I think a very easy example is curl. So, curl is a command to actually download files to actually show files download. So, if I do curl dash V uh, Google.com, they show me this right. Oops. If I don't do dash v, they will just show like uh, this, uh, this like, thing that they get from google.com. But if I add a dash v there, it will actually give a more verbose output and they will actually show me like in this case like additional information of what they're doing, that kind of thing. So most commands would take dash small v to mean uh, be more verbose in the output, show more things. And there's also another dash v, but this time it's a big v. That means version. So if I do curl dash big V, whatever I thought afterwards doesn't matter because dash V usually would just mean like look for the version number. So I know now that I'm using curl version 7.54. You can do that to bash also. Oops. Uh, okay, you can't do it to bash apparently. Bash is quite old. But if you do to other things like uh, Python dash V, Python by default shows your version, so it doesn't matter. Like, but like Ruby dash V, it will show you like, oh, my version is 2.6.0. Or like Node dash V, it will show you the version. Like it's a bit inconsistent between different programs between big V and small V. But if a program has a small V to mean verbose, they would use the big V to mean version. But the safest will always be to look at a man. It's just like all these dash, uh, dash V or like dash H is to 
look for the like it's just a quick way to look for things for help messages. Any question? Okay. So uh, now that we know about how to make a script, I'm gonna talk about the shell syntax. So like, like I said just now that shell is actually a programming language. So I'm gonna teach you this programming language. So if you've already known programming beforehand, like you've already used another language beforehand, I'm just gonna like try to translate some of those concepts into how you would do things in Bash instead. So first of all, to run a command, you just use the command and give the arguments afterwards. So for example, echo hello. It just means like I want to run this command called echo. And if I ask what does echo do, it would actually just write arguments to the standard output. Like it would just output, just print. That's what echo is. So if I do echo hello, then it would just like take in hello as the argument and then like it would just do echo hello. Yeah, echo hello, and it would just do hello. And there are variables. So for example, PS1, right? PS1 actually stores uh, whatever prompt that, uh, whatever prompt. So if uh, I set my PS1 to be this, then it would change the prompt. The prompt is basically like the part before wherever you type your command. It can be multiple lines. Like for example, my prompt for my local computer is actually two lines. But by default, it's just one line. It will show like your username, your computer name, and then afterwards, your di the directory you're located in. And then this thing can either be a, a, a pound, a hash, or a dollar. Hash means you're a super user. And a dollar means that you're just a normal user. So here if I do SU, right? Oops. Then I would get a pound also. And basically the way to do it, uh, the way to like uh, store variables, right, is to actually just Uh, to just do like the name of the variable, say yeah, in a, you want to name your variable name, for example, and you want to fill it with uh, Julius, for example. I just do this, name equals Julius, and you must make sure that the equal actually is like right next to the name. I don't think you can put space between. So if I do this, now I already thought my name to be Julius, and to access it, you need to put dollar in front. So dollar name. And I can't just do this directly, because it would just run a command called Julius, right? Because dollar name is now filled with Julius. So what I can do is I want to print this uh, this name, then I will get Julius. The neat thing about variables is that like if you just put a variable directly, the shell will just interpret it like as that variable being substituted with whatever the content is. So for example, if I do like name equals ls, right? And then name is now ls. So what happens if I run name directly? You run ls. So basically, like, be careful with variable, because unlike in other languages, you cannot run a variable. But in shell, you can run a variable. But it also means that you can do some neat things. So like you can put uh, commands into variables, and you can just like, evaluate the variable to run the command. Any question? OK. And there are also like some uh, special variables. So there's dollar question mark, which means you get the exit code of the previous command. So if you learn, anyone here learned C before? OK, some of you. Basically, uh, in C, uh, you have, at the end of your main function, you have to return a number, right? Return 1, return 0. That's called a status code. So basically, programs use the status code to indicate to the caller whether you succeeded or you failed. By convention, zero means you are successful, and whatever that's not zero means you failed. So uh, let's say I do ls, it should be all right, right? So if I echo dollar, sorry, dollar question mark, I should get zero. But if I do something that's not successful, so say for example, I do like, uh, okay, let's rm a non-existent file. This not, th there isn't a file called this, right? If I enter, then they say cannot remove file. 
So if I look at the exit code, one. So basically anything that's not that's not zero is a failure. You also have dollar one to dollar nine, which is argument to a script. So let's open back your example script just now. You have this, right? So say instead of this, you do echo dollar zero, echo dollar one, echo dollar two, echo dollar three, for example. So what's dollar zero according to the slide? It's the name of the script itself, right? And dollar one to dollar nine is basically the argument to a script. So if I I save this, right? So now what happens? What do you think will happen if I just run this? What will you print? Example script with like three blank lines because you don't have any arguments. But say I do like A, B, C. Then it would print like example script A, B, C. So like dollar one to dollar nine would be filled with all the arguments. And the arguments are separated by space. There's also dollar number. So if I change my example script to instead just print dollar, dollar pound then it would print like how many arguments I passed. So in this case, how many arguments did I pass? Zero. zero. So you should print zero. But say I do A, then you should print one. one. I do A, B, C, D, E, F. You should print six. So using this, you can know like how many arguments you actually passed to your script. So using this, for example, you want to create a script to delete fast, right? You can just like take in an argument and run rm dollar one, for example. So you can pass information to your scripts using arguments. And that's basically what your, yeah, what your other command does as well. Yeah, this is what we did, right? Any questions so far? It's okay, don't be shy. If you have any questions, just ask away. Okay, so now there's loop. So how many of you know what's a loop? Okay, so what's a loop? Yeah, basically you want to repeat the same thing like several times. That's a loop. Okay, how many of you actually like just found out the meaning of loop for the very first time here? Okay, then <laughs> I guess everyone is quite familiar with the concept of a loop. So in a shell, you can actually do loops. So for example here, I want to repeat echo hello five times. Instead of typing echo hello, echo hello, echo hello, echo hello for five times, I just, I can do this instead. So like for i in sec15, do echo hello, and done. And if I press enter, it should print hello five times. So it seems quite magical right now, right? Like, oh, what's happening? So let's unpack this. So first of all, we have this semicolon thing, right? This semicolon actually is the same as a new line. So if in your script you use new line, you can actually just do it in one line and use a semicolon. Because if you do it in shell directly, right, we type it directly, you can't exactly like write a new line to give another command. So just use a semicolon and then provide additional things. So what a for loop do, like this is the format. So you have a 4x in, then you give a list, then you do, give a body, and then done. So uh, what it does, it would split the list, assign each thing to x, and then they would run the body with x containing whatever, like each thing in the list. So for example, here if I, instead of doing echo hello, I do echo dollar i, right? Because I assign each element of the list to i, I should get one to five. Because they would assign the content. And in this case, like uh, basically what they would do is they, they would split by white space. So white space means like either a space, a new line, a tab, like those are white spaces. And we will get into it later because it can be a problem. And compared to like C or JavaScript or Java, if you've learned it, like they use curly braces to indicate beginning and end of block. Here instead we use do and done. So you indicate like you begin with do and you end with done. So say instead of doing, yes? So SEQ is the sequence? Uh, yes. The yeah, I'll get into it later. Yep. So uh, say instead of doing just printing number, you want to also like echo hello after the number. You can just add more things inside your body. And now it will print like one hello, two hello, three hello. Like the body is demarcated by do and done. 
And there's this sequence, so like the part that you ask. So sequence is actually an external program. So you can actually run like man seq. You actually print sequence of numbers. So the first one is the like where you want to start, how many is the increment, and then the last number. So if you don't provide the last number, by default, it will be one here. And if I just run seq15 by itself, right, it will actually print this like one to five directly. So if, say, I want to print one to 20, I can just change it to 120. But if I provide like three inputs instead, then the part in the middle is actually the increment. So say I want to, I only want like all the odd numbers between one and 20, then I can do this. And I will only get all the odd numbers because I increase by two every time. And you notice that this SEQ15 is actually surrounded by this dollar parenthesis. And this thing would actually substitute the content of whatever you print with the up, as the output to the program. So like if you notice, I do SEQ15, I get one to five, right? So what it's doing is actually it would fit this in into the program. Like it would just replace whatever is inside the dollar parenthesis with the output of this thing. So if I do, like I, when I'm doing this, right? Uh, dollar SEQ15. You know the output is one, two, three, four, five, right? It's actually equivalent with just replacing this one, two, three, four, five. Like both are equivalent because you just replace the output of SEQ15 into the program itself. So if I do this, you should get the same thing also. And echo hello, it just means like you would echo hello and they will actually run commands. Like everything in a shell script is a command, like basically. Including, like basically as long as you don't have like all these uh, special, uh, special words like for, later on you would learn if, the rest are all commands, that like they're always uh, regarded as a command. And the way they actually search for commands is they will actually use this path, like it's not too important, like you can read about it more about this dollar path thing if you want to. Any questions so far? Okay. And the thing about this list, right, it doesn't only take in number. You can also do like, uh, like QWE, ASD, ZXE, and then when you do it, it will also like do uh, whatever is inside the list. So it can be letters, it can be numbers, it doesn't really matter. So the next thing that I'm going to go through is actually conditionals. Conditionals is basically to like branch out, right? You check whether something is true or not. If it's true, you do something. If it's not, you do something else. So let's do this then. If test dash d slash bin, then echo true, else echo false, fi. And it should get true. So you are kind of confused, right? What's going on here? Like it just prints true. Or like if I change bin into uh, something else like ASD, then it would print false. So you should kind of know, like the get the big picture. So basically like you have this if statement. So an if uh, would take in a condition and a body at the very least. So in this case, the condition is dash, test dash D slash ASD. So what you would do, it would actually run that command see what's the exit code. If it's zero, it means success, right? Then it's regarded as the true. So if it's true, it will run the body. Otherwise, it wouldn't do anything. Or if you have an else block, like here we have an else block, right? else equal false, then it will run it. But say, I don't have the equal false, I don't have the else part, right? I just do this, then it would just, it would, it would just not do anything. So you can actually check whether this is true. So like, uh, if I do test dash, dash d slash bin, right? And then I echo the exit code, you should get, oops, test the exit code, I should get zero. But say I test for some non-existent directory, like there isn't any slash ASD because we don't create it, right? And then you echo, it's actually one. You see, it's actually a like fail. So you can use this test, test to like check for things. So in this case, we're using test dash D so what dash D does is actually checking whether a directory exists. 
So if you want to see more details, you can always do man test. So they will tell you different things here. So if you're looking for dash D, you see file exists and it's a directory. So that's what we're doing just now. We want to check whether like this thing exists and it's a directory. So if I do instead of instead of dash D, I do a dash F, right? F means that like, the file exists and it's a regular file. Obviously, dash bin exists, but it's not a file. So if I instead do test dash, dash f slash bin, I should get one. Because it does exist, but it's not a file. So basically, using this, you can actually test for different, dif like many different things, and you can actually uh, perform ac like actions according to whatever is the result. And because this thing is so often, right? And running and writing test is a bit longer <laughs> than just writing square brackets. That you can actually replace it with a square bracket. So just now this thing, right? You can actually write it instead as this, and it will still do the same thing. So if I add an else equal false here, it will print false. So if you actually run a uh, man, this thing, right? This uh, open square bracket, it will actually tell you that the two are the same, test and the open square bracket. So you can either run test with the expression, or you can just put the expression in between the square brackets. Any questions so far? And yeah, basically in this thing, you can actually have like so many different things. Like you can do like, uh, all the checking with checking about files, checking the length of string. You can check for other things. You can even do like and and or, like you can do whether file one is newer than file two. Like you can do a lot of different things here. And using scripts, you can actually automate some stuff. For example, like if the file is newer, then you don't remove it, or like you remove the older files, that kind of things. So now, let's combine everything that we learned uh, together. So we want to create a command like ls that only prints directories. So right now, if you do ls, right, it will print everything, every single thing that there is, right? Like I have, I have my files, example script, test.py, and I have like my directories, tmp and world. But let's say I want to create a script that only prints directories. So like, let's do the same thing. Open your editor and like uh, type this thing. So the shebang. For f in ls, do if test d f, then echo is a directory f fee done. Let's save this as ls there, for example. And don't forget to like uh, ch mod plus exit. Uh, ch mod plus x ls there. Okay, so uh, okay for writing these files, right? You might be familiar with the so-called Egyptian bracket. So like when you type c, right? You can actually. Uh, you can actually just do something different. Okay. So when you write C, right, for example, you can do like either this, right? Or you can put the uh, this square this brace on a new line. So it's the same thing. So here you can either do this, right? But some people don't really like it because they want to actually just do this instead. Like, the style is up to you. You can also do this. Like, this thing works the same. It's just basically like putting the do on the same line as the for and the then the same line as the if. And then, if you, if you run your ls there, right, you would see that actually now it only prints like the directories, right? You have directory tmp and you have directory world. But now there's a problem. 
let's say you have a directory called my documents. So let's do that. Just to show you here, so like I create a new folder called my documents, right? So now if I uh, if I list it, you see there's a directory called my documents. So what happens if we run ls there? Is my documents printed? Okay, what, what do you think is happening? Let's try running it locally. So if you do 4f in ls, let's just echo f, right? And do this. Okay, everyone understand what's going on here? So if I print it, oh no, my document is split. It's my and documents as separate things. So basically, this is what I uh, said just now about uh, bash splitting by white space. So white space is like all space. So including whenever the file name is, has a space in it, it will actually split it separately. And this is actually not what we want, right? We want my documents to appear as one. So bash has a solution for this. Okay, yeah, uh, basically this, this is what I'm talking about. So like right now, it would just test on my, test on documents. And they don't exist. They are not a directory. So it wouldn't print it. It would just dear TMP and dear world. There's no dear my, because my doesn't exist by its own. And document also doesn't exist by its own. And basically, uh, in bash, right, if you want to actually send it a string that contains a space, you have to quote it as, uh, you have to quote it with a double quote. So for example, if right now I do this, right? My documents. You see that they are separate. But say I actually want it to just be its own, like one thing. What I can do is I can actually uh, put a quotation mark on it. And it will actually treat it as just one thing. Right? The whole MySpace document is one string that is passed on to F and then printed. So what do you think if instead of doing this, I put a quotation mark around it? Yeah, because when you run, when like this thing, right, we just uh, take everything here. And then you do this, right, it will just take everything, like the whole thing with, even with spaces. And they are just taken like as a string, as a very long string, they are separated by spaces straight away. So this wouldn't work. But the solution is this thing called globbing. So uh, basically in bash, whenever you want to look for files, like you want to pass argument, you want to run commands, and you want to pass file names as the argument, you don't have to type each of them, but you can actually automate uh, this looking for files using patterns. So this pattern is called globbing. So you have the asterisk, you have a question mark and everything. So like asterisk means any string of characters, so anything goes. It can be nothing also. So like, uh, for example, if I, okay, so uh, here we have lock, right? So if I do ls, l o asterisk g, bash would actually like replace this asterisk with anything. It can be nothing, it can be some other things. So if I do this, it would just do lock. But if I, say I have another file called uh, loag, right? If I do this, then it would list both loag and log. But if I do, and the alternative is actually a question mark. A question mark would only fit one character only. It has to be one. It cannot be more. It cannot be less. So if I do question mark, it would only give me loag and not log. Okay. Uh, this this kind of like a kind of it can be confusing. So like anyone here kind of confused with what's going on here with the patterns. Say again? Yes. So say I want to look for anything that begins with my. Okay, wait. Am I in the right one? Yeah. My should work. Hmm. Oops. 
Oh, okay, ls doesn't, okay, by default, when you do ls something, right, it doesn't, okay. If I do echo this, it should print this. So if I do echo my, yeah. So it prints that. So if I do, so the thing is, right, if I just do, if I just do a star, just a star, it will match with everything, correct? Because a star would match anything from nothing to like any other thing. Basically, anything goes. If I just put a star. So we, we can do it will come with this. Yes. So if I do echo this, right, yeah, it prints this. So what happens if I do for i in this? Do echo i done. Yeah, it will basically like, uh, instead of separating everything inside the ls by spaces, it will actually be bash itself that will actually like look for the files and pass it to i before then running the body. Or like one other alternative is you can also do like uh, this curly braces thing. It actually means like uh, look for any of this character. So l and I just want like okay let's have another file called lag. So now if I do ls l g, there's lag and lock right. Say I want to specifically look for lag and lock. So let's create another file called lick. And then uh, I want to find just like and lock. So I can do uh, like L and then A comma O G. So this means look for either like or lock. If I do this, it would do this. So uh, we can replace instead of doing for F in LS, in our LS there, right? Instead of doing for F in LS, we can replace this with a star. And then uh, if we run it again, oops. And then we need to code this because uh, cause now it, it got space. So if you don't do that, then it would appear as if like you're trying to pass to, uh, okay, if I run this dash that's the my documents, it would actually run this, right? If I do that, then it would be confused. Dash D, it should be checking for only like one argument. Why are you sending me two arguments? But if I do this instead, like with the code, then you're actually, actually sending my documents as one argument to the test command. And it would actually like uh, do the proper, do the correct thing. So two things I need to correct. I need to change the ls into a star. And then I need to code this here. So after you do that, if you run ls there, then you should get the correct thing now. You get dear my documents, dear tmp, dear world. Everyone okay? Yeah, you can also make advanced patterns. So what do you think this means for F in A star? Everything starting with A. How about this one? For F in full slash star.txt? Anyone? Any text files? Yes. So any files whose that ends in .txt and is located inside the full directory. How about this one? Uh-huh. Actually that is inside the directory foo. And Uh huh. It's like three letters long, right? But it starts with P. So P plus two additional characters ends with dot txt, and this uh like you have this this thing, right? That means that it can be in any subdirectories of foo. So um, so the question mark it could be any characters. Any characters. characters. Yes. Anything. Anything at all. So uh, if I go above here, right? I do for f in. I just want data slash. Just slash like that, for example. Then I echo. Then you see I'm actually getting all the files that are located inside data. Oops. Yeah, here. You see, like it's basically anything that's inside data. I want to get anything inside. Yeah.
Yeah. So all three letter text files starting with P in subjectives of foo. Any question? Okay. There are still possible issues here. So if I do this right, if I check whether dollar foo is equals to bar, what's the issue? Do you see the issue? No, no, equal is fine. Because if you man test, there's actually like a equal, S1 equals S2. So it's fine. But what could go wrong here? Remember your white space? What would happen if foo contains a space? Yeah, so say, uh, hello world. And then I check. Uh, foo equals bar. They would say too many arguments. Why? Because the foo would actually be expanded to hello world. So now instead of having like just like uh, the argument is like content of foo equals and bar, you actually have hello world equal and bar. So. Uh, one possible solution is you can just like uh, quote the foo. Oops. So if you quote the foo like that, right? That it should work. Okay, this is fine, right? What happens if foo is empty instead? So how do you think this thing would look like if you translate it to bash straight away? It would look like this, correct? What do you think would happen if you run this? It will just error out again, right? Because <laughs> it expects to get three arguments, but it's only getting two. So there are a lot of issues with this, lah. Like, yeah, arguments to the to the test would just be like equals and bar. There's there are workarounds around this. So like, okay, if you run this, uh, if you okay, let's change to some other things. There are possible around. So like what you can do is you can put like an X in front and X in front of this. So what will happen instead is like whenever it's empty, it wouldn't be empty because you always like uh, prefix it with X on both sides. But that's not really a good solution because it's very hacky, right? Like what like people reading your script would just see and like what is this X? Why does this X exist, right? So what people would usually do is actually use a built-in bash uh, test which is instead of one square bracket, it's actually double square bracket. So if you do uh, help double square bracket, then it will tell you like, uh, it will actually execute the conditional command. It's pretty similar to uh, test, except that you can actually now do like the proper, uh, proper operator like this and, and this or, or a not. Whereas like if you actually use the normal test, right, you can't actually you can't actually do this. Like you have to use dash O, dash A and stuff. Like uh you have to use dash A and dash O, which doesn't look as nice compared to N and O. N and like R. So in order to prevent this, right, actually there's a very good tool to check for this kind of possible bugs, like it's called shellcheck.net so uh, if you open it right you can like type your you can actually just copy paste your script here and then like it would give you the output so for example we do whatever we did uh, in the beginning right so for f in ls do if the f then Echo dear F. Phi done. Okay, do you see? Like they give all these different things. Like they say like, oh, you need to put double quote to prevent globbing and world splitting. This thing you need to double quote. And this so they actually do like you can apply fixes, it will automatically fix it for you. You see, like it will auto quote and everything. 
but it will still like, tell you this. You shouldn't iterate over ls output. You should use glob instead, which is what we said just now, right? So this one, they can't automatically fix it because they don't know what you want. So say I change this with this glob, right? Then, OK, there's no shebang. So let's add a shebang. Yep, no issue detected. So like, this is a good way to check whether, like a good way to, a good quick way to check whether the script that you wrote is good or not. You can try using this. So like someone actually wrote this script. And if you're writing a script, you should use this to prevent unwanted issues like white space splitting and whatnot. Okay, so that's the first part. I'm gonna give you like a 10 minutes break. And after this, we're gonna go to data wrangling. If you have any question, just, you can just ask me or like just raise your hand. We actually have several helpers here so that if you have any question, you can just ask. Uh, no, I'm using item. It doesn't matter, it's about the same actually. Okay, it's slightly faster. <laughs> but it, it doesn't matter, like faster in printing stuff. But if you're using for very basic stuff, then it doesn't really matter actually. But you can try item. It's, it's quite similar. Like this, the, the learning curve is not too, too bad like, if you try to use item. My Linux is not on my computer. It's actually like I have a server somewhere else. Oh, you, you SSH into the yes. Sunfire, is it? Uh, not Sunfire. Oh. It's, it's my own. Your own uh? mm, Digital Ocean. Okay. That one you can buy on GitHub. Uh, if you have student account, you can use GitHub Education Pack, then you can get a voucher for $50, I think, for Digital Ocean. Okay, how much do you have to pay for that? I don't have to pay <laughs> yet. Yet. Uh, you get $50 for free. Like just go to just search online, get up education pack. Okay. You, you should grab it. There's a lot of free stuff, free nice stuff in it. Yeah, but mm, I I'm using the machine that's five dollars per month. Okay. US dollars. It's the same as single uh single thing, mm -hmm. except like, for this one right. Uh, Bash will actually take care of you of a lot of like all these annoying things like uh, when your when your variable is empty that kind of thing. Oh, so if you use it's just like test stuff. Oh, uh, it's the same as test. Oh. What does Bash do to me? Uh? Is Bash uh, check whether it's a directory. Check whether it exists and it's a directory. You can do man test right. Yeah. Then you can search for dash d there. Because if I don't use dash d right, mm -hmm. will forever return me zero zero which is like true right. Yeah. If I any if I do yeah. something that doesn't even exist, I press test. Yeah, it, it it wouldn't do anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then technically you can hide everything in the shell. If like in your form, like it's just very painful to do. It's nice for quick and dirty scripts. So you just want to do this very quickly, like okay, like typically whenever you start using scripts, yeah. if your script is longer than like I don't know, fifty lines, then yeah. usually it's better to use other tools to do it. So shell, is it faster when you, when you compile and run straight away? Or? Not really faster in that sense. It's faster for you to type. Because okay. you can, it's fine. It's the same, fine. 
it's going to be slower than other things. Like for example, if you do like string processing with Bash, it's going to be slower than if you use like C or something. Yeah, but usually it's good enough for our purposes. So it will, if you press enter, it will compile and write. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's interpretable. It's like JavaScript. You don't compile, you just run. Like Python, you don't compile, you just run. Yeah. Then how, then how do you get Python on your Mac? Do you use, do you use I use Brew. Oh, brew. Yeah, Homebrew. Homebrew. Yeah. Oh, not, not Vim. I, that's not Vim, right? The one that you use. Which one? I, I use Vim as an editor, also. Yeah, yeah. Then how do you. Because I saw you edit a Python with a Shift M, right? Shift yeah. You use. Uh, I use Vim, yeah. Just now, like, I only use Nano in the beginning, I use Vim yeah, afterwards. Yeah, so you use Vim, uh -huh. then you put a Python Shift M, yes. and you run. Yes. How do you do that? Uh, you, you just change the shebang so like I can bring it up. Hey, sorry, I have a question for you. <laughs> so right, just now in the shell check script that you wrote just now, right, how huh? come you just needed to use the single bracket and like don't need to put like test or anything like that? Oh, it's That's it's an right. alternative syntax. So you can either do test something, okay. or you can wrap the thing inside a inside square, bracket. square bracket. So what, yeah. what's the use of the square bracket? It looks nicer. <laughs> That's it. Like, what's the functional use? Like, what does it actually evaluate for? It's the same as test. Exactly the same. So, oh, it's exactly the same as test, just that it's, it's an a integrated shell feature. To you know, it's an alternative syntax. Like, you can okay. type that instead of, like, because it looks nicer. Okay, so when you put, like, square brackets, it's understood to everyone that it's the same as test. Yeah, that's why, that's why if you actually uh, go man this, right? They would yeah. say that actually, like, you can either use test, like, you can either use test. Or you can do this thing. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah the two it. are equivalent. The not equivalent one is if you use double square bracket. Can you explain to me just what double square bracket means again? Uh, it's just like you do, instead of doing that, you do this thing. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So this thing is not an external, like it will actually be bash that evaluates it. And this thing is nicer because if you use variables inside, it would actually be safe. Yeah. Okay. I get it. So, in a sense, Okay, in a sense, the single square bracket is like a, fu a test function. Yeah, it's the same as fun. It's the same, like exactly the, the same as test. The square bracket is like just a bracket in like C or something. Just like <coughs> to demarcate between code. Yeah, code it just looks nicer. Because if you do test, right, then it looks asymmetrical. It's okay. just test something. But yeah. if you do this and you know that whatever is inside must be something you run in test. Yeah. So, okay, in bash scripting, there's uh, white space and indentation method. No. no, it's not Python. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just that. That's why you have the do, done, and stuff. That's why Python don't need do and done, because you demarcate using white indentation. Yeah, so for this, right, if I put my shebang to be Python, uh -huh. then they will just pass this whole thing to Python. But I don't have Python, right? I don't have Python. As in yeah, then, then you, you, you can't. Yeah, I downloaded already, but then so is if I, if, so that's why it's Vim. If I Vim my. You don't need to use Vim, you can use, like, it, it doesn't matter if you use Nano or Vim or whatever. Is it because it's just a text editor? Yeah, yeah it's just a text editor. It's just, it mat what matters is your shebang. Okay. If your shebang is... But I, shebang doesn't, as in, I've never used shebang before. Eh. Like yeah, shebang just means that if you make the file executable, yeah. then you need to know how to interpret this. So basically you're running through the Python. Yeah, I, I'm saying that this thing is like, please pass this to Python. Oh. If I use bin SH, I, I, I'm saying like, please pass this to shell mm. to run. That means I don't have to compile this, right? You don't compile Python, lah. Yeah, you don't compile Python, right? Yeah. So I, I, I don't. So it's you. The USR is user, is it? Yeah, user. Yeah. So I just like run. See if I can skip this shit. Skip that. Then mm -hmm. I can just CH mod. What CH mod do again? Uh, change mod. You want to make it executable? Plus X, is it? Yeah, plus X and give your file name. And you can dot slash that thing. That integrator, no, not the directory. Oh, so I don't have that, is it? What, what what do you type? I think you have a slash where you don't have a s when you shouldn't have a slash. There isn't a slash after env. Okay, okay. So yeah, then just run it. Okay. Yeah. Huh? Are you How do you uh, yeah. uh, I can't find you later. Sorry. Yeah, I can find me later. Yeah. Okay, so let's continue again. 
So uh, the next part is composability. Like this is the part where we actually, like where the Unix philosophy number two comes in. So if you remember the Unix philosophy just now, number two says you write programs to work together. And this is where like shell really shines in as compared to other, like, other languages. La. So they have this thing called composability. So what it means is like you run something, get the output of one program, and use it to fit in the next one, and you keep on doing that. So you can chain multiple programs together. So like each program can be a small program. They just do one thing, but they do one thing well. After they do their thing, you can pass it on to the next program who will actually do another thing to the data that you finished using. So for example, let's do this. So D message, which basically means like you want to find like the, like the kernel logs. Basically you want to get like the system messages and then you use tail. So D message, use that thing, it's called a pipe, and then tail, then you enter. Then it should show you the last 10 lines of, uh, of the kernel. If you're using a, if you're using a, sorry, if you're using a Mac instead, you might need to sudo it, so you need to like sudo D message tail, so it's the same thing. And you'd get the last 10 lines, basically. So what it means, right, whenever you have this A pipe B, it means that uh, like run A, get the output of A, and then feed it as an input of B, and print the output of B. And you can actually like chain this even further, basically. Like you can just keep on adding pipe A, pipe B, pipe C, pipe D. You can keep on doing that. And that is what is called composability. Like the ability to, for you to compose using smaller, uh, smaller commands to actually do something useful. Yeah, so you can make it even longer. So uh, as an example, let's do this. So like, this one is a system lock. So you cat var lock sys star lock, and then grep. Grep means grep, which means that you want to match based on patterns. So in this case, we're just looking for March 23rd. That's why you do like grep, or I think you need a, you, you need a quote here, by the way. Grep March 23 and then you do tail. And you will only see like the last 10 messages that whose date is March 23rd. So like if I don't do tail right, it would get this. If I do D message by itself, I actually get this all this like, very long thing, right? So uh, I, I, I get all these long things. Like if I do a GREP, March, March 23rd, then it would just show me like all those that happens on March 23rd but I only want the last 10 lines, then I can do tail. You see like how I'm composing, like I'm using this to compose uh, like something useful out of little commands. All cat does is read the file and print the con content. All grep does is like it would read whatever is fed into it and just print out uh, the lines that matches whatever you ask it to find. And tail will just print the last 10 lines of whatever is being fed into it. And all this work together to actually give you what you want. Anything inside this lock whose, that, that contains March 23rd and the last 10 lines only. Any question so far? Okay. And uh, the concept here is actually based on something called streams in Unix. So all programs in Unix, whenever you launch them, they will open these three things called streams. So there's STD in, there's standard in, standard out, and standard error. So what are those? So standard in is basically just, usually it's your keyboard. It's like the input of each program, whatever they would take. There's also standard out. So the program would definitely, would usually just print the standard out. That's basically your shell, like your monitor. And there's also standard error. It's a, it's a second output the program can use, usually to print error messages. Because sometimes you don't want to see the error messages, then you can just like filter out the standard error so you won't see it. But by default, both standard out and standard error is your terminal. Like whenever you run your terminal, they will just output there. And standard in is your keyboard. So whenever you run something, it will just take in from there. So uh, what you do when you pipe, right? is actually redirecting these streams. So when you run A, by right, standard in is your keyboard, right? Or whatever it is. Uh, 
and it would output to the screen because there's a standard out. But what happens now is that you're taking the standard out of A, plug it to the standard in of B. So now for B, instead of taking directly from your keyboard, it would take its input from the output of A, from the standard out of A. So you just like plug it, like take the A's output and put it into B's input. But you keep B's standard out to your screen. So you can still see everything. So that's what's happening here when I run all these commands. Like, all, like cat doesn't take anything from standard input, right? It just runs, but it outputs to standard output. But now the standard output is taken and fed into the standard input of grep. So I can show you something. So if I do uh, just grep mar23, right? So what happens if I do something like that? It wouldn't do anything. <coughs> if I do mar23, blah, 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 you see? It actually outputs that mar23 again. Hey, can you see it? So uh, if I just type in something that doesn't contain mar23, it doesn't do anything. But once I type in something that contains mar23, it prints that to standard output. So if I do something mar23 something, it will print that. But if I do something, type something that doesn't contain mar23, it doesn't print it back. So that's all it's doing. Like basically, grub just takes in the standard input, check against the pattern. If it matches, they will just output it. And this thing is quite useful for other things also. So for example, you can actually uh, redirect the standard output to a file. So uh, when you run this, right, you have this uh, thing that you output to the screen. You can actually redirect the stream, the output stream to the screen to go to a file instead. So instead of doing this, you can output to a file, say you want to name it like uh, syslog, for example. When you enter, nothing is printed to, the to your screen. Because now you redirect the standard output of tail into a file, syslog. So instead, if you look into syslog, right, it would actually contain whatever the output was just now. And then it's the same thing for, uh, you can do like, uh, too larger than sign, that means that redirect to a redirect the standard error to a file. You can also do like from standard input goes to the file, another file. So for example, uh, instead of doing cat, right? Because cat just takes a file and prints its output, correct? You can actually do like grub March 23rd, and then you redirect its input from a file, which is this file. Right, and then you can tail it, and you can still get the same output. Because uh, for A, smaller than sign, like basically it would just take a file and use that file as a standard input instead of your keyboard. And you can also do A, and then like you take in some text. So for example, you want to grub, uh, let's use this, and it contains much 23rd, right? Okay, let's say you want to search for March 23rd from some text, but you want to type the text directly. Then you can just like uh, put the text here. So say this thing actually contains March 23. Then it will print it. But say it doesn't, then it wouldn't print anything. Like all this uh, triple uh, re input redirect do is actually it would uh, make the standard in whatever comes after the triple redirect. Any question? Okay, uh, any, like, I, if any of you are lost, like, you can just raise your hand and like, ask me to re, uh, explain again because this is like a different concept from what you usually have. So you might ask yourself, like, why is this useful? The whole reason is because it lets you manipulate the output of your program. So like, for example, like, uh, instead of just using whatever the content of the file is, you can look for certain patterns, you can like, say like, oh, I only want the last 10, I only want the first 10. So like last 10, you can use tail. If you want the first 10, you can use head, for example. Like there are many, all these like small little commands that does one thing well that you can use to build a larger, like a larger uh, functionality, basically. So for example, I want to list files and only get those whose name is foo. I can do ls, pipe it to grub. 
and find for something. Like for example, in this case, I don't have anything called foo, right? But say I want to find for PDF files, then I can do that and oh, look, there's a file called hacker2.pdf. If I am inside my data directory, right? I have all these log files, so I want to search for uh, anything that contains a G inside. I can just do grip, grip G and it would give me all the files whose name contains G. If you use PS, so P all PS does is list all processes that is running on your system. So if you do PS, right, it would show you all the processes. Say I want to search for uh, bash. I can do PS, pipe it to grub bash, and it will show me like all, all the bash that's running in the process. So you can use the output of one, feed it as an input to another program. That's what the pipe does. If you're using Linux, for example, uh, you have this, pro this thing called journal CTL. So all it does is prints, it prints the syslog, right? You can, actually, you can achieve the same thing just doing like cat var log sys slash log. Like, it's the same thing. So say for all of this, I only want to see like anything by Intel. Oops. Anything by Intel and it must be case insensitive. So I can, it can be small Intel, big Intel. In this case, I don't see any. Because, I don't know, maybe my server doesn't run on Intel. <laughs> but let's say I want to look for something else. Like for example, I want to look for kernel. I can do this and it will show me everything by kernel. Right? And say I only want like the first five. Then I can do head. And this head command, right, actually it takes in uh, dash n flag, which is count. How many do you want? So head display the first lines of a file. So this is what I want. Say I want to see the first five lines. I can do head dash n five. So all it does is it would print the, like cat will actually get the system block. You pass it using pipe to grub to find only for lines that has kernel inside. And then you pipe it again to head because you only want to see the first five matches. And if I do this, there, it only shows the first five. See, uh, I have one, two, three, four, and five. And this stream redirection actually follows, like, it actually like forms the basis for your data wrangling. So, uh, it's gonna be covered after this. Uh, any questions so far? About stream redirection and pipes? Okay, you all can try on your own terminal as well and like make sure that you understand what they do. And, okay, uh, this part is about grouping commands. So basically what you do with grouping commands is actually like you can group them together, group the output of them together before you pipe them to another thing. So for example, uh, I can do uh, echo A, echo B, right? And echo A again. And I can do this. What do you think will be, what do you think you will get? Okay, first of all, if I just do this, what do you think will come out? What will I see? ABA, right? ABA. So if I group this in a parenthesis and then I group A, what do you think I will see? That all the ones containing A, right? So you can actually just group commands, group the, all the outputs together before you pipe them, which can be quite useful. So for example, uh, there's this command called tech. So if you look at the man page, it basically print file in reverse. So if I uh, echo QW, echo ASD, echo ZXC, and then I pass it to the tag, what do you think you will see? Uh, you, you just see everything in reverse. <laughs> As compared to like if you just do it directly, then it would be like QW, ASD, ZXC. Like, this might be useful sometimes if you like print log files and they are sorted from like earlier time to later times, and then you want to see it from later to earlier, then you can just pass it to TAC. So like, if I do uh, sudo, okay, let's, okay, let's look at the lock and just look at the last five. So I have this, right? 
And if you see the time is actually increasing, like 655, 656, 656, 23, and so on and so forth, right? If I pass it to, if I pass this to tech, right? I can see it in increasing order. See, like 56, 24, 323, like instead of like chronological, it's like reverse chronological. Uh, they should cat var lock sys lock tail and five tech. Which one? Uh, hmm? Do you install the Xcode command line? You doesn't have tech. Oh yeah, it's. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're using OS X, cause yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I think it's only on Linux, and yeah, you can brew install it. Mm. Core utils, yeah. So you can brew install core utils if you're using brew. By default, they should install it, I think, in brew, or not. I don't know. But yeah, if you're using Mac, then you might not have this unless you specifically install it, basically. But uh, the concept still stands, lah. Like you can use, you can pass it to grub, you can pass it to anything. There's also something called process substitution. So this one is actually a bit different. So you might look at this, uh, like this sign here, and you might think that oh, actually, like this this thing is like. Uh, it's an input redirection, correct? You change the standard input of a command. But it doesn't do that exactly. What it does is it will actually like uh, run whatever command that is inside the parenthesis. And after you're done, you will actually uh, like output this to a temporary file and you pass on the file name. So to demonstrate if I do this right, echo a. What comes is actually like a file name, like a, a temporary file name somewhere. You don't actually get like the echo a. But say I do cat, what does cat do again? It prints files, right? So if I cat this, I actually get A. So the file does indeed contain whatever I run inside. So uh, if I, okay, this one you can't really do on, on, on Mac, but if you use Linux, uh, you can actually do this. Okay, as in, uh, so there's this command. So like, if I do echo A, echo B, right? Echo A, echo A. So uh, one file will contain just A and B, and one file will contain A and A. So if you have these two files, you can actually look for the difference between the two files using this command called diff. So uh, let's just say I do this, right? I can actually see that, oh, look, like at the second line, like 2C2 means like uh, second line, second column, you have this difference, like one is A, one is B. So uh, what? Like how is this useful? So like uh I can actually do this, so like I can diff journal ctl dash b dash one hit n twenty. So all this all this mean like the journal ctl dash b dash one, it means like, I want to see the boot lock. Dash one means like the last like the previous boot lock. The one lock one lock ago. And I want to diff like I want to differentiate it from the one that is two boot locks that is two boots ago. And I also want to compare just the first 20 lines. Then it will actually like give me all this, like what's the difference in the two files. Like it can be useful this way. Whenever you like you, have, you, you want to run these two commands whose results are kind of similar, and you want to see what's the difference. So the most useful one is for example, uh, you're doing your programming, your programming task, right? And then uh, you have some test cases. You can do that. So you can just run it using a process substitution. The other one, you can just pass in the file straight away. And you can see whether the output is like same or different, just using process substitution. Okay, uh, there's job and process control, but I think I'll skip that one. Like you can read it if you want, but I think for whatever we're doing right now, like it's not really relevant. 
for what we're doing. Uh, yes, so I'm going to get into data wrangling, which is like building straight away from uh, the composability that we used just now. So yeah, basically, it's like whenever you have a bunch of text and you want to do something with it, like you want to get uh, something useful out of your data. Because sometimes like, you have a like, very long data. Like for example, in your logs that you have, right? You have this log file. You notice actually it's, it's a lot of data. Actually, there's 9,000 lines inside. Imagine if you have to imagine if there's like you have some error happening somewhere, and you have to look through these 9,000 lines. Like, it's not really nice, right? Like it would take a long time. So what you can do is you can actually use the shell to help you like. Use all these little tools to find out whether, like, what you exactly want, basically. So, data wrangling, all you do, all you do is actually you, for, you convert from one format to another format, and convert to another format again, all the way until you get what you want exactly. So, uh, like this, what we did just now, right? Like journal CTL, group dash i intel. So, like, it basically is an it's a very basic example of data wrangling. Like, you take the, you take one thing that outputs a uh, text, right? And then you want to do something with the text. In this case, we're just looking for lines that begins with Intel. But actually, like, there are more things that you can do with this. So let's start from the very beginning. Like, we basically need a data source, and we need something to do with it. So data source is usually the first thing on a pipe, and what you want to do with it is basically what comes all the way after like the pipes, all the following pipes. And a good use case for this is logs. So like that's why I send you the logs. So I'm sure all of you can read the logs, right? Like you've got it extracted and uh, inside your folder. So uh, make sure that in your terminal you change directory to where you store the logs because we're gonna do like some things with the logs. So like here on the screen, like basically you have the logs here, and as I showed you, like, actually the last line is actually like 9,000 lines. You're not going to be able to read all this in like five minutes or something, right? Like it's a lot of things. So say I want to figure out who's trying to log in into my server. So uh, if you notice, you would have this thing. So like, uh, yeah, so for example, you have this thing like accepted public key from Turing, blah, blah, blah. So basically Turing is trying to log into my server and yeah this is also Julius I think yeah Julius trying to log in so like you can have like these different people who try to who's trying to log in and what I want right now is to see like who's trying to log in so if I if I just do cat lock there's a lot of things right like you're not going to be able to read all this it's too much things so let's try to grab it some more you notice that actually here uh, whenever there's acceptable public key, there's SSHD, correct? Basically, SSHD is what's responsible for people logging into the server. So you might want to just see like messages from SSHD. So how do you do that? What do I pipe this to? Anyone? What's the command to filter out lines? Grab. And I want SSHD. Do I want it to be case insensitive? Yes, no? No. Because SSHD is all like all uh, lowercase. And I want it to be exactly that. So if I do that, oh look, it's, it's way less, right? Imagine like if you look at this and you look at this, you can tell that it's definitely less. But it's still a lot of data, right? You can see like it's actually still a lot. Like you're not gonna be able to read through all this. And one way to actually see how many lines you have, right, is actually there's this command, double WC, word count actually. But you can use like other options to find out other things like dash L means count the number of lines. So if I do enter, you see, actually there's still like 1610 lines. So definitely it's way less than what we had just now. We have 9,000 lines just now, right? Now we only have like 1,600 lines, but it's still a lot. And we want way less than this. Maybe we can. Filter is some more. You notice that whenever that you someone log in, there's always this word, accepted public key for, right? That you can go out and see accepted public key for whore, for Julius, for whoever it is, right? 
So you may want to actually filter it some more. So let's filter by using grab. Accepted public key four. And let's see the number of lines. 461, much better, right? You get one quarter of what you had just now. But there is still a lot, a lot of data there. And also there's a lot of this noise that you don't want to see. Like, do you care about like the beginning part? March 21, Julius, PTS, blah, blah, blah. You don't really care about those, right? Like you only care about who's logging in, which is like, can be Julius, can be Turing, can be Curry, Newton, or whoever it is, right? So there's a way to actually get rid of those noises by using this tool called FED, set. So what's set? Like set is actually a stream editor, like set stands for stream editor. So like if you uh, open the man page for set, it would tell you stream editor. So what's set? It would actually like, it's a stream editor that builds on top of the old ED editor. So if you use Vim, like how many of you use Vim? Or were forced to use Vim? Okay, yeah, so Vim is actually like, it comes from V. V is actually the visual mode of ED. So if you know Vim commands, you would kind of know e, like set commands because set is based on ED commands. And ED is basically like the common ancestor of both Vim and set. So the most common ones that we're gonna use right now is substitution because we want to basically like uh, from the logs, right? We want to be able to see all this like garbage and remove them and just be left with what's useful. So to do that, you can actually run this. So like, uh, actually, it's okay, so if I do set, substitute accepted public key, okay, I forgot the, this, accepted public key for, and then this. Do you notice it's a lot cleaner? Like this is the command that we did just now. So do you notice that all, all the garbage in front is actually gone now, right? Like last time, if we don't use this set command, oops, you have all this garbage in front, the date, the time, the, uh, the SSHD, but you don't need those, you just need the name. So if we do this, do you see that like all the thing in front is actually gone? And the way to do this, actually, we use something called regular expression. How many of you have heard of regular expression before? How many of you actually use regular expression? How many of you can read regular expression? <laughs> yeah, like it's a, it's a kind of complicated tool, but it's really useful to have in your toolbox, basically. So uh, this is the command inside that we used just now, right? You see, uh, I use s slash something slash, then there's nothing there, slash, right? So actually this is a command format. Use s slash the regular expression slash what you want to substitute it with. So in this case, I substitute it with nothing, but say I substitute it with like hello, then it will actually change it with hello. You see like everything now begins with a hello because I replaced this whole pattern accepted public key for with hello. So that's a set command. But then we still haven't gone through this like regular expression part, right? So it's like if you don't know what's a regular expression, it's actually like it's just some construct. It's you can call it it's kind of a language, but it's not really a language. It's just a construct for you to actually match different text against patterns. So you can specify some patterns and you can see like which text actually match that pattern. And you can that way you can actually like manipulate text. Uh, usually they are surrounded by this slash thing, so like you see here, this, er this is a regex and you actually like, uh, they are surrounded by the slash. And most ASCII characters would just carry the normal meaning, but different, like some special characters, some other characters, usually is the punctuation would have like a special meaning to it. La. So like here, if I do accept the public key for, those are ASCII characters, they are just like, normal alphanumeric letters, they usually just have the normal meaning. But for like, there's a dot there, you will see there's a dot, there's a star, like the asterisk, it will actually mean something different. So uh, for the meaning of special characters, I have a list here. 
And in case like you're new to regex, you can actually open this website like and learn about more regex. But right now I'm just gonna go through like some quite basic regex. So you see there's a dot. Dot just means like any single character except new line. So it wouldn't match new line, but it would match with anything else. You have a star, which just means zero or more of the previous, like you special a pattern, you can add a star to it. So it just means like one or more. So if you look here, dot asterisk. What could that mean? Dot means any character other than new line, right? And asterisk means the preceding pattern, you get zero or more. So it can be nothing. It can be one character. It can be two characters. It can be like many characters. It doesn't matter as long as it's like zero or many. But if you want only one or more, you can use dot question mark. So that means that any character except new line, it must be at least one. So it cannot be nothing. There's also like this square bracket thing. Square bracket, it means like any of the characters inside. So if I do like square bracket A, B, C, it means like either A, B, or C. And I can also do like a special one like A dash C. It just means like within the range A to C inclusive. It's those character set that I want. Or I can actually do this with the like the thing that looks like a pipe, that just means all. So like other Rx1 or Rx2. And the Rx1 and Rx2 can actually be regex themselves. Or I can put uh, that carrot thing, which means like match only at the start of the line or dollar for the end of the line. We're not gonna use like many of those, so you can learn yourself after this workshop, because there's really a lot of like regex and there are many more than this, like there's look ahead, look behind and other stuffs. So uh, the thing is, there's actually two different regexes right now. There's something so-called obsolete regex and there's what called modern regex. So if you use the Vim's regex, a lot of them are a bit weird, like you have to uh, put backslash before many things. And this is because they're using something called like obsolete regex. But for set, thankfully, you can pass on this, this flag called dash E, right? It will actually tell set to use the modern regex and it's the one that is like common in everywhere basically. Like you can use it in Java, Perl, Ruby, Python. Like they use all the modern regex. And if you want to explore more about this, you can actually go to man re underscore format. And they will tell you all about like this like uh, obsolete regex and the modern regex. But for our purpose, I'm just gonna show you like how to use the modern regex. So like set dash big E because that's much easier to read. So looking at our regex just now, we have this regex like dot asterisk accept the public key for. So uh, for this one, as I explained to you, basically it would match anything before accept the public key for, and then it would do everything. Uh, yep. So the problem now is what if your username is also accept the public key for? So the problem with this is that asterisk is by default greedy, like so-called greedy. So what does greedy mean? It means that they would try to match as much character as they want. So imagine if uh, the username is accepted public key for, then you would have it twice. So one way to really easily see it is like there's this website like uh, regexer.com for example. So let's type that in. So this one example, you see that it will actually match against this, right? And below you can see like all the different meaning of whatever we put in. But imagine if the username is also accepted public key for. Okay, so after this you have like some other stuff afterwards, right? So imagine if instead of root, you have like also accepted public key for. Do you see that like actually the dot will actually match as much as possible all the way until you can match the accepted public key for. And this is a problem, because then we would actually lose the username. I mean, like, of course you wouldn't have someone whose name is that, but it's just like a possible like flaw in our program. So one way to solve this is to actually be more specific with our patterns and also use something called uh, capture groups. So here, actually, we can create this uh, very long regex. So 
it looks very daunting. So let's look at a regex with a regex debugger. Yeah. Yep, so this, uh, is, this is a different website from just now, but it's kind of similar. So you can see here what's going on, right? Like you see this regex and they would show you like which part matches which part. So you see this part, right? Like this part would matches with this part and everything. And like you have this part. So you see this, there's this, this thing, right? Matches with this. See like this green thing is this part. You see like they say first capturing group. And this part is the match one. So that's the first match. This is the second match, second capturing group, and this part. And there's this part also, the third capturing group. So I'll just explain to you very briefly about what the regex does. So first, it's still dot asterisk. So that's still fine. So it's still the same, right? Just match as many as possible. And then you would want to see for accepted public key for. And after that, you have this dot asterisk again, which means match as many as possible until you encounter space from space. So now you're being very specific with your regex. So you match acceptable public key for, and you also match for from. So definitely what comes in between acceptable public key for and from must be the correct thing. So if you look at the last, at, at the last line here, right? The example, even when my username is acceptable public key for, they would still be able to recognize that it is like indeed the username because it, it comes in between accepted public key for and from. So when you are being very specific, then you can find more things. Any question? Yeah, this is a very useful thing. So for example, you can go to the regex debugger and you can, okay, let's increase this. Like 80. You can actually see how they try to match it. So see, like they would try to find first for A because the dot asterisk will just try to match as many as possible. So let's like jump here. So like you see this SHA, right? It will try to match A, but it can't. So it wouldn't keep on going until it finally matches this one. Once it do, and then like it would try to go forward and try to match more. Oops, okay, so this, yeah. Then it would just keep on going. So you can actually like see for all this, what they are doing. And then, yeah, it would look for space from space. It can't find it, so it would like keep on going like that all the way until here. Uh, you can finally find from that it would do all those. Yeah, if you're interested, you can always like uh, check this out afterwards. Okay, wait. I actually need the. I need this. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, so instead of doing this, let's try doing. Uh, whatever we type there. So accept the public key for. Okay, uh, let me open the. Yep, so basically I have this and then replace it with nothing. What do you think will happen? Okay, hold on. Something's not right. Okay, I didn't put dash E. What happened? What do you think happened when I ran this? What, why, why do I get all these blank lines? Yes, because I'm now I'm matching against the whole line and I'm replacing the whole line with nothing. So now I like I end up with nothing and that's not what you what we want either, right? So uh, what we want now is capture groups. So if you notice in our regex debugger, you notice that I actually put these things in between parentheses and they say it's the first capturing group, second capturing group, third capturing group, and so on and so forth. Like basically whenever you put something in between parentheses, you're telling regex, I'm interested in whatever is inside this. Please capture, capture those. 
and you can actually access those in uh, the set replacement by using backslash in the substitution. So like the first capture group is backslash 1, backslash 2, backslash 3, and so on and so forth. So looking at this thing, the username is, what's the, num what's the capture group number for the username? The first one, right? So capture group 1, correct? So what we need here is to output the first capture group. Now if you press enter, you see, everything is just a capture group. Because if you look here, like, see, it, it captures root, captures root, captures like this, accessor public key for. So now we replace, basically we replace this whole, we have this whole thing, but we're just interested in the first capture group. So we just print the capture group. And that's like one example of doing it. Any questions so far? Yep, so this is what we're doing. So like, uh, basically, if you notice also here, I'm actually also capturing some something else. Like for example, second capture group here is actually the IP address, right? Group two, and group three is actually the port number. So here, if instead of capture group one, you replace the capture group two, you should get the IP address, right? If I do capture group three instead, I should get the port numbers. And I can do other stuff. For example, like I want to like have one, comma, the IP address, comma, the port number and I should get those also, like name, comma, IP address, comma, port number. So you just put into your substitution whatever you want. But in this case, I'm only interested in the username. So it's just backslash one, right? So that's all good and nice. And yeah, actually like you can read up more like about regex. Actually like it's quite an interesting topic, can be quite daunting, but yeah, it's, a very, it's very handy to have. And back to here, so like we already have this, right? And this is quite useful. You already have all the usernames, but it's still a lot of usernames, right? We may want to get like more, like we want to get statistics out of this. So for example, you want to see like, uh, okay, and another thing that I need to bring up is that set is actually quite powerful also. So instead of doing this, instead of just like using group and then set, it's actually possible to do everything in set. <laughs> Okay, so uh, look at what's happening here. So what you do is actually, first you look for this pattern, accepted public key for, the bank says, look for lines that doesn't match this. D means delete. So delete all lines that doesn't match this, which is the same as doing grip with this pattern, right? So if I actually do that, so, Yep, so if I do this, I should end up with the same thing also. Like, we can do everything with set actually, but usually you wouldn't want this, because like, imagine like typing this, it's much longer than like, if you just like, grub accepted public key for, right? You don't have to even remember the bang D and whatever. Like, that's why we usually just use grub instead of that. And there are actually like many more different uh, patterns, so you can just like, uh, do like man sed, and they would actually show you like all these different uh, commands. Yeah, they have like the, yeah, all this number, W, T, whatever. You can just use it. And then we're gonna go now to like more advanced data wrangling. So we have this thing, right? They will print all the user names, correct? But let's say instead of this, we want to see the common usernames. Like, what are the common usernames? What we can do is actually we can pass this to, to sort. So sort will, well, obviously like sort the usernames. So you see like there's Turing, XXX, Newton, Hall, like all sorted by the alphabetical order, like lexicographical order. And then what you can do is you can use this command called damn it, uh, unique. So what unique does, it would actually remove all the like lines that, all consecutive lines that are the same. So you see here, like, like many Turing's, many Hors, many Julia. So if I run this, I just end up with all the unique names. But the condition to uh, pipe to unique is that all the data must have already been sorted in the first place. That's why you need sort first. 
And there's one more thing that I can do. I can do dash C for count. So what happens if I do this? I get a count. So there are 88 Curry, 76 Einstein, and so on and so forth. So now if you look at this, you know that like, oh, there are this many usernames in the, in the fast. Like, look at this, like you're just using, cap, you're using like all these little tools that does, some, does only one thing, something very little, but we can achieve so much using these tools, right? Like this, all the Unix philosophy is about. So we've already seen this common, like this uh, common usernames, but imagine you have way more usernames than this. Say like you have like 1,000 different usernames and you just want to see like who's the top three. How would you do it? Okay, can you just like, okay, can someone just explain to me how would you do, it, do this like manually if you were to sort, like do this manually? You want you want to only see those like the top three usernames whose count is the highest. So you, you need to sort them, right? And then uh, into head, yeah, entry, correct, right? So you know that the next part should be entry, but you need to a way to sort this, correct? So there's actually like sort actually takes in flags as well. So if I do sort dash n, it means sort by numerical order instead of lexicographical. Like for example, have you ever had this problem where you have like, uh, you have file whose name begins with a number like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then instead of for your and then your program instead of sorting it one to ten, it does one, ten, two, three, four, five. The reason being because they're using lexicographical order, so like longer, like longer comes first, even though it's actually should be like done by number. So if you do sort dash n, what they do is they will actually sort based on a numerical order. And then K11. So K means you only sort by the column. That's what K means. And then one comma one. So what does it mean? It means that one, the first one means I want to sort based on the first column. And then comma one means I'm only interested in the first, like just in that field. So only one until one. Like if you go to man sort, and you look for the dash k, see they say sort based on a key. So the key is like location and type. So like in this case, I'm just giving it like the location, which is the index, so like the first field, and only the first field. And if I do this, look, now I sort based on the first field. Okay, the field, like the, the meaning of the field is basically like separated by space. So in this case, it's the count, right? Space, the username. So there are two fields here. The first field is the count, and the second field is the username. So by saying dash nk1, comma one, I just want to uh, sort based on the first field and by the first field only. So now that I have this, okay, uh, because these are being sorted in increasing order, so instead of head, actually I want tail, correct? So I just do tail dash n3 and boom, I got it. And if you have tech, you can actually like use tech to actually make it like be in this kind of order. So what if I actually want the three least common ones instead? What should I change in my command? If I want the least common ones instead of the most common ones. Anyone? Yeah, change the tail to head. So if I do that, then I'm gonna get like the three least common ones. Yes, dash R. So if you do this, then it will start ascending, right? If you add uh, dash R to it, it will sort in reverse order. You can actually look at all these things. Lah. So like they have this uh, dash R somewhere, yeah, R reverse. Okay, any questions so far? Like, do you notice like, like basically based on this now, you can make something like very, very advanced, right? Using this.
Okay, uh, I think we don't really have time to do AWK, but like, if you want, you can also look at AWK. Like AWK can do stuff that set cannot, because AWK is actually like a fully, it's actually a, it's a, it's a full programming language. So you can do stuff that you can't do with SED. So if you're interested, you should look it up. But uh, otherwise, you, sh you, you can use this. Lah. And like one thing that I want to show you also that's quite cool is that uh, your shell by default has a calculator language. It's called BC. So if you run it, you can do all sorts of things. So like, what's 5 plus 5? 10. What's 2 to the power of, uh, I don't know, 24? Sorry. 2 to the power of 24. It's this number. How about 2 to the power of, like, uh, I don't know, 60? Oh, 2 to the power of 60, then it would tell you. So, uh, if you are able to actually, like, uh, so if you do this, right, and then, uh, so, let's do another set here. So, okay, let's substitute now. I Okay, uh, do you know what I just wrote here? Can someone explain what I just wrote? Okay, what do you think this would do? Let me run it. So what do you think that do? What do you think did I just do? Basically, I'm looking for like a space, like two things separated by space, right? And I just want the first thing. So it's the same as like, I'm just taking the first part. And then there's this cool command called paste. So I'm skipping to awk, because I was going to explain how to do this using AWK, because it's much nicer. But let's just do it using SED, because you can also do it using SED. And the cool thing is that, OK, there's this part, paste SD plus dash. So what, do, what does paste do? Let's look at the man page. Man paste. Merge lines of files. So what does it do? Let's look at it. So what do you think does it do? Anyone? Okay, so basically what it does right now is it's taking these uh, lines, right? Because uh, the output of the first SED is just lines containing numbers, correct? So what it does is it changed the new line into a character that I specified, which is a plus here. The dash just means that I don't want to read from any file, just read from standard input, because I'm piping to it. So now that I have this, do you see that this thing is just a mathematical expression? 88 plus 86 plus 76 plus blah, 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 right? So what I can do is I can pipe this to BC. And if you remember just now, BC is calculator language. So I can actually sum them up, and BC will tell me, oh, the total is 461. Anyone? <laughs> okay, any questions so far? Okay, do you all understand what's going on? So if I repeat from the beginning, cat lock means like I want to get the content of lock, grep sshd, so filter only the lines containing sshd, and then filter by accepted public key for, Using set, replace all that using this regex so that I can only get the usernames, sort the usernames, get the like remove the duplicate usernames and give them the account, sort them. I mean actually I don't really need it right now because like actually I don't need to do that to do a plus, right? But then after that I actually using paste I turn the new lines into pluses. And then at the end, I just do BC, which would just take in the expression and give you the result. So you can do math with bash. How awesome is that? So I have some exercise for you. So OK, let's do this. Find the number of words in. OK, so. Uh, I'm not sure, but every Unix should have this. So if you do cat 
user share slash dict slash words. You should have this like long list of dictionary. So what I want is uh, please tell me the number of words that contain at least three A's and it doesn't end in apostrophe S. And remember, you can actually tell the number of lines in the output using WC-L. So in total, there are like 200,000 words in my, in my Mac. And if I do this in my Linux machine, it's 234,000, so around there. So, yeah. How do you think you would approach this problem? Okay, let's do the easiest one first. You don't want to have a apostrophe S ending. How do you think you should do it? Anyone? Okay, uh, the way is actually this. So like if you look at uh, the manual for GREP, there's this option called dash V, which means invert match. Meaning only give, only give me lines that doesn't have the pattern. So you, with the knowledge of dash V, how would you, how would you do it then? So here, what, what do I do? GREP and then dash E and dash V, uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, yeah, by the way, uh, if you want to use the modern regex, you should also do like either you do dash, like you should do dash E, by the way, in grub as well, if you want to use the modern regex. But yeah, in this case, you don't need. So, okay, so what do I need here? It should be S. So now if I look at the number of lines, it should be lesser, right? Oh, apparently all of them doesn't have the apostrophe S. But if I do it on a Mac, it should make a difference. Hmm, it doesn't. Something is not right. Oh, okay, all of them already doesn't have apostrophe S. But say now I want the words that contain at least three A's. How would you do this? Mm -hmm. mm, do you think that would work? Let's try. I'm getting nothing. Okay, let's look at the very first. Okay, this is an example of something that contains three A's, correct? It's actually inside. So by the way, you should be able to match this. Yeah, this one is look for, yeah, correct, you're, cor you're right. It's looking for three consecutive A's, but what I want is for the sentence, like for the word to just contain three A's anywhere. Group A would just mean one A's, but I want exactly three A's. How is it? Star A, star A. What does this mean? Okay, by the way, for, for group, you should use the, this, this one, by the way. So anything, it's not. Star means, okay, what does star mean again? Let's look at the. Okay, what does star mean again? Zero or more of the preceding match, which is the preceding pattern. So the first star, it got preceded by nothing. This would not return anything also. Sorry, dash E. Yeah, see? Repetition, pro repetition operator operant invalid. Because you put a star, but there's nothing before. But star here is a modifier of something that comes before it. So what should come before the first star? Dot. Dot star means match anything, no matter how long. So we should do this for all of them. So it means that we just want anything that contains three A's inside, no matter where there is. 
That's why, like, it's just A, 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 then you can put anything in between, or after or before. And you should get a long list of things that contains exactly three A's. So, originally you have like 200 and something, right? So, for this one, yeah, there's only 7,000 words that contains exactly three A's. So, now how about this one? What are the three most common last two letters of those words? How would you do this? Okay, first of all, like, okay, okay can you explain to me in layman terms how, would, how you would do this? In terms of piping. So you have all these words, right, that has three A's. What do you do so that you can calculate, that you can find out what's the three most common last two letter? What do you need? Yeah, basically you want to get the last two letters, correct? Thankfully, tail can do that. So if you do man tail, there should be this thing called dash B, no, dash C, dash C, means the count. So like if I do echo, ASD, ASD, and then I do tail, dash C, two. Three, two, hmm. Is it B? I think it's B. No. Wait, what? <laughs> is it dash N? Oh, sorry, it's, no, it's, it's not dash N. It's C, sorry, it's correct, it's C. So, okay, hold on. Uh, Yeah, I do it. Oh, okay. You actually can't do that, but yeah, you can. You can filter just uh, for the last, the last two things. So the way to do it is actually to do this crop again dash e. And then uh, there's another there's another flag called dash o. Dash o means you only print whatever matches because by default group would print the whole line, correct? But now we just want to print the matching one. So, what do you think is the pattern to match just the last two? Using this, what do you think? How how do you think we can match the last two words? Sorry, the last two letters. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Dollar, yes. Or you can do like dot, dot, dollar, same thing. So this thing should only match the last two. Then it will just give me all the last two. Using this. And then, uh, okay, so now we already have like all the last two endings, right? How do we find the three most common ones? What should we use next? We did this just now, right? So we should pipe it to? Uh, not yet. Unique requires the data to be sorted. So you need to sort first before you can unique. Okay, so if you sort unique, then you only got this. So. Okay, what, what do you need now? Dash C. So you get all this, right? What do you need to do next? Sort again. Sort by what? R. K. R and K. One, one. Because you want the first field. Then you would sort by that, right? And then, what do you do next to get the three most common? Hit. Dash N, three. And there we go. We got the three most common words. Uh, sorry. sorry, the most common. Mm -hmm. uh, just now when you, when you use grab, you mentioned that it's better to use single quotes. Any reason for 
Ah, yes. When you use double quote, they would still expand globs. And you don't want that whenever you use like dot asterisk. Isn't the asterisk is actually interpreted as a glob by dash? Yeah. And then, uh, so how many of how many of the two letter combinations are there? How do you do that? So just now we use this to find the two all the two letters combination, right? How do you know how many two letter combinations are there? It's kind of similar, so we need to find out like how like all the unique two letter combinations, right? And then you can just find out the number of lines. That should be the number of two letter combinations, which is 150. And the last one is actually it's quite challenging. So I'll leave it as an exercise. So I hope you all have learned like a lot of things today, right? Especially how to use shell. So like if you have any question, you can just uh, email me. Like you should have my email from the from uh, whatever I sent. So thank you for coming. Do come for next week's one, which is like Hacker School Part Two. And please do fill in the feedback form, like this is the URL.